All right. We are in John, uh, not John, I tell you what, <laughs> been all over the scriptures this morning already. Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6, and I think we got up to verse 22. Um, so we've gone through the, uh, the seven days of preparation around the city of Jericho. So it's presented in three stages. So we get the description of the first day. This is what they did. Uh, then we get the description of the second through sixth days. And this is what they did. And little details are being added as we go through. Um, and then finally, we get to this third presentation where it is the seventh day and they march around seven times. It's only on that day that they march around seven times. And then Joshua gives an extended set of instructions to the people. Um, what he has, he's not told them, at least we've not seen him tell them up to this point. Um, what we read in verse 17, the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Right, remember, the key word there is harem, devoted to destruction. Right? It, it's dedicated to the Lord. It is special. Uh, only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest you, when, when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. All right, so remember the consequence um, for taking anything that is harem is that Israel, all Israel, becomes harem. All Israel becomes devoted for destruction if they take something that is devoted to destruction. Now, this is not the first time that Israel has heard this, by the way. Um, they've received these instructions in Deuteronomy 13 as part of the law uh, in preparation for entering into the land. Um, but Joshua is laying this stipulation down specifically for the case of Jericho that everything is a rem. Um, we're going to see in other places that some of the other cities are not entirely devoted to destruction in the way that Jericho is. Jericho is under an even more expansive ban uh, than, than everything else. Right? Jericho is a special case. Everything gets destroyed, including the city itself. So that brings us up to... Oh, uh, the last thing I want to remind us of. All right, so... Uh, so the trumpet sounds, Israel shouts, the walls fall down, and we read about them just going up into the city. We do not read anything about any kind of battle. And it's like we've been saying all along, the Lord has already given the victory to Israel. Right? We've seen the hearts of the people had melted um, everybody has been terrified, right? the city has been shut up because they are afraid of Israel. And so whenever the walls fall, Jericho just doesn't even put up any resistance that we read of. Israel is able to just go in and the city is there. There's no ensuing battle because the victory has already been given to them by the Lord. So that brings us to the special instructions about Rahab. Uh, let's go ahead and start in verse 22. But the two men who had spied out, sorry, to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belonged to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day. 
because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. All right, so we just, uh, before we read this, we read the ban commandment. Um, and I want us to notice how the story of Rahab's you know, being saved from the city is going to built off of the ban commandment. All right, so back in what we read in verses 17 and following. Joshua gives the ban. He says, everything that's in the city shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab shall be saved. Everything else is devoted to destruction. You keep yourself from all that stuff, lest you make yourselves devoted to destruction. All right, so you've got this, this structure, a really simple structure. You start with the stuff that's banned, the exception for Rahab, the stuff that's banned. It goes in that order. Rahab, or like the story that we've just read about Rahab being saved out of the city, reverses that. So we read first about Rahab. The young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her entire household. So we get the salvation of Rahab first. Then they burned the city with fire and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. So we read about, again, about the stuff that's banned. Stuff that is harem. But then the story returns to Rahab. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belong to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. So we get like this, this A-B-A pattern. Um, and the Rahab story in verses what we had read in the band story. Yes. Oh, I thought I saw your hand up. Okay, sorry. I'm used to seeing your hand up, I guess. Um, uh-huh, yes. Starting to see things. Um, let's see. Okay, so this is another example of, again, the story, the way that the book of Joshua lays things out is very deliberate and very repetitive, but it, it, to make sure that we are connecting all of these things together. Right? Because why is Rahab not under the ban? Why is she different from all of the other stuff that's devoted to destruction? The text gives us the reason. Solomon? Because she hid the messengers from Joshua. Yes, she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. That's the difference. All right, the text has spent all this time playing up. You know, here's how you treat everything in Jericho, except for Rahab. Here's how you treat Rahab. All right, and we go back and forth between these things. So, like, by the time, I mean, we've read, you know, I've, I've got this giant print Bible. These instructions take up nearly the entire page in this Bible that I've got. Um, talking seven or eight verses, long verses. And the whole point of it is to draw our attention to this distinction. What saves Rahab, what keeps her from being harem? It is her faithfulness to Israel. And that faithfulness is rewarded by her having a place in Israel. She has lived in Israel to this day. Excuse me. So this, this gives us something of a final note on Rahab's conversion. Rahab's household remains in Israel to this day. Uh, you know, whatever, whenever this is being written, although there's, there's a broader sense in which we should understand this. Uh, all right, so it was, it was true in, well, actually, it's, it's true in a literal, physical way still. Um, we'll come to that in a second. Uh, so whenever the book of Joshua was being written, Rahab's household was still a part of Israel. Rahab still had a name in Israel. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean, by the way, that Rahab herself was still alive whenever the book was written. Uh, the focus here in this text has been at the household level. Right? The entire household is saved. It's important that we remember that too, by the way, because that's going to be contrasted over and against Achan's household in just a minute. 
Uh, but because of Rahab's faithfulness, her entire household is saved, and her name is preserved. And so Rahab's name has a place in Israel forever. And that is still true to this day. Right? Remember, the Hebrew writer reveals her, and I mean the, the author of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, reveals Rahab to be a part of the true Israel, the Israel of faith. Right? By faith, Rahab hid the spies, the Hebrew writer tells us. She is, biblically speaking, a Christian. Right? If we extend this, this understanding of who belongs to God the same way that you know, the New Testament authors do, uh, we receive a full telling of the gospel through her story. Right? It's a story of her doomed state at the beginning, followed by her repentance and conversion, followed by her salvation. Right, and the, the point of this statement is that her name still lives. And in fact, in a very real way, her name does still live. Because who's her most famous descendant? Jesus. Yes, our Lord. And he's still alive. Right, the name of Rahab is still around. The name of Rahab is still alive and well in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is a, this is a story of the endurance of faith, the enduring reward that comes from faith uh, that we shouldn't miss, right? This, this isn't just something that's relegated to the past. This is something that's still present and alive. Wayne? Okay. You didn't see that, right? Yes. But uh, I see a thousand uh, uh, relative uh, things of the New Testament. Okay? I mean, almost every word. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes. Then uh, the Lord will descend with a shout. Yes. And that is rather evocative, isn't it? Yeah. It's almost literal, right down the line. Yeah, and we've got our own Jericho coming. Right. And exactly. how are we going to react? Are we going to have the reaction of Rahab? Yeah, it, won't, it won't be a reaction because there won't be resistance because we can't do that. I mean, right, right. But that's, that. yeah, that's, so that's the thing. Like, the reaction had been set before the trumpet sounded. Right, so Rahab knew that Israel was coming. I mean, the spies were there. Uh, it is it, to read this whole thing messianically. The spies are evangelists, right? And they, you know, Rahab responds to the call of the gospel, as it were. Uh, and so, whenever the trumpet sounds, and whenever the shout descends, whenever the Lord knocks down the walls, Rahab and her household are saved. It's just a small room. And it is a small remnant, yeah, yes. Like Few there are that find it. Yes. So here we go again. One family that has the whole entire city. Yes. It just keeps repeating. This story just keeps repeating. And so, yeah, we get, we get a full telling of the gospel here. Yeah, whereas, you know, if Rahab accepted and converted, the rest of the city of Jericho rejected, denied, tried to shut up the walls. And then their judgment falls on them and just the, as quick as that. And the guy who's come to do it, she, mm-hmm. she's Joshua. Yes. Yes. Explain me how Jesus was a descendant of Rahab, but I, I don't get that connection. Um, so uh, she's named explicitly in Matthew chapter 1. Yes, she was. Yeah. Let me turn there. Let's dig around here. Okay, yeah, so uh, we can just read the first little bit of Jesus' genealogy. Matthew 1, verse 2. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, all right, here's where we're at. Salmon, the father of Boaz, who we read about in the book of Esther. Not Esther, Ruth. Um, Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. There we are. 
and just yeah these these are the kinds of things that are easy to miss um, yeah um, let's see it's a good question all right so all in all this is a this is a story of keeping faith Rahab has kept faith with Israel and now Israel reciprocates that by keeping faith with Rahab Wayne? Yeah. Now she's repentant. Now that's no longer a part of her life. Yeah, we kind of learn the rest of the story, as it were, you know, afterwards. I mean, it just even in a little thing like we just read in Matthew one, we learn that Ruth becomes the the wife. Not Ruth. Where is my head today? I'll tell you what. Uh, Rahab becomes the wife of Sama. Um. Uh, don't recall I don't think that we read about that in the book of Joshua if we do I don't remember Saul? is there any significance uh, I agree with what you're saying but is there any significance that they still keep calling her a prostitute like it's her title like, yeah I mean that's just who so yeah I mean that's just who she is yeah that's just um, just like Matthew's all in the text right? yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, we don't get exactly. Yeah, we don't we don't get all of the details about what her life was like after this. We do know that she becomes some man's wife, and so you know we we hope all the best for that. Um, but I just find it interesting because uh -huh. we, uh, it's not our righteousness you know, because we're uh -huh. always the sinner. You know, right. God, who's the, the savior. Right. So like they're saying, go into the prostitute, get the prostitute. That's the important part. Is that is God is saving the prostitute? You know? Yeah. And like, she's still like, you know, she's still responding. She still has faith. And everything, but right, and that's ultimately, you know, this it's one of the things where we we let Scripture have the last word on it. That she's lived to Israel in the in Israel to this day. That she's an exemplar of faith, like we read about in Hebrews eleven. That she is part of the genealogy of our Lord. So I think, you know, we can, I can strongly suspect and hope that she repented of prostitution, yeah. uh, to, to your question. Uh, the thing is that I mm -hmm. see, um, I'm putting a lot of this in the context with me, uh -huh. is that, okay, she came to repentance of those things she did before. Uh -huh. Those things were forgiven. Uh -huh. Those things are gone. They're out. You know, and they, even though they, they talk to talk about her as the prostitute, uh -huh. it's kind of like a name brand that you carry like I do. Uh -huh. Well, it's like, like what John was saying about Matthew. He's, he is always Matthew the tax collector yeah, yeah, to yeah, us. Yeah, and so it's not that uh, you're not forgiven. Right. It's the fact that they, they, you are forgiven. That's the point. And that's yes. The, that's the point yeah. is that you are forgiven. Yes. Yeah, and I, I think that's the right way to frame it. I think that's the white, right way to frame it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And that's that's the thing. The you know the gospel call goes out to people in any condition. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, it just so happens that uh, the text for the sermon today is going to be specifically about one of those instances. Anne? In this scripture, we, I, I don't see anywhere in this little part that we've read where Jericho fought back, did they know that they were already doomed because of the margin? I think that's the sense that we get. Yeah, that they, you know, like we read, um, let's see, like we read in chapter 5, verse 1, you know, their hearts melted. There is no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. Um, in chapter 6, verse 1, they're clearly terrified because they've got the city shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. 
Hey, we, we get the sense that once the walls fall down, they just give up. Yeah, we, there's no fight in them. Good question. All right, so that brings us to the end of the chapter. Verse 26. <clears throat> Joshua laid an oath on them at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. All right, this is... Now, so now I think about it, this, this is something that we would call Chekhov's gun. Y'all ever heard of Chekhov's gun? You ever watching a movie and the camera focuses on some odd little detail like a gun? What do you know is going to happen later on in the film? Something's going to happen with that gun. Right? At least in, in good storytelling, you don't get these kinds of things usually where it's just a, a complete throwaway scene. Uh, Gosh, was. Oh, uh, Joshua's curse here is very much a Chekhov's gun. Joshua has laid this curse on the city of Jericho, and then we're left to wonder for quite a while, all right, is anybody ever going to try rebuilding Jericho? Uh, it ultimately does end up happening. And I think for the sake of time, we'll just look at this. There's, there is some background to this in the law. Um, if we go back to Deuteronomy 13, you can see the basis for why Joshua is laying this curse. Uh, but for the sake of our time together, we are going to go ahead to 1 Kings chapter 16. All right, so we're looking much later in Israel's history. First Kings chapter 16. Um, we're going to read just a short, short story that happens during the reign of Ahab. So already looking at bad times in Israel. What we read in verse 34 of 1 Kings 16. In his days, that is Ahab's days, Heel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segur, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. And you notice the way that that plays out, like word for word, what Joshua said. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. And that's exactly what happens. El tries to rebuild Jericho, and his firstborn Abiram dies as he's laying the foundation. His youngest son, Segov, dies as he is setting up its gates. As far as I know, we, we don't learn anything else about uh, El's project to rebuild Jericho other than his lost sons. But we do learn something interesting here, though. Um, so you look at the way it's presented in Joshua 6. Who's laying the curse on Jericho in Joshua 6? Who's it all pinned on? It's all Joshua. Right? Joshua laid an oath on them at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds the city Jericho. We don't have any kind of indication whatsoever. And this is just... And uh, we've talked about this pattern before, but I want us to see a really clear example of it here. In the text of Joshua, it looks like to us, maybe, that Joshua is just speaking for himself and laying this curse down on Jericho himself. But in 1 Kings 16, where does the curse come from? Who originates the curse? God. According to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. The text in Joshua didn't tell us that. This is the Lord speaking through Joshua. 
And this is something, as we have gone through, I've said, you know, we'll see points where the Lord tells something to Joshua that we're shown. And then Joshua relays the instructions to Israel, but then adds a bunch of details that we weren't shown earlier. And the way that we're to understand that is that this is all the word of the Lord. Right? That Joshua is inspired to say all of these things and give all of these commandments in the way that he does to Israel. And I think this is just a clear example of that. Wayne? Doesn't it kind of, uh, doesn't, doesn't God kind of close that off and tie that up at the next verse there in 27? It says, so the Lord was with Joshua. Yeah, that's... So that kind of adds that... I think that includes the curse. Yeah, I think this is, this is also aimed, this is much more broad than just the curse, though. Yeah, what we what we read in verse twenty seven, and we that tells us that he's the one behind all that. Yes, if there was any question, uh, there there can't be by the end of this chapter that it is the Lord who's doing all of this. And you, you typically, when the, the Lord speaks audibly to a prophet, mm -hmm. he goes and prophesies. To me, when I read this, this screams that the Holy Spirit may have been upon him before he said this. Now we don't get this verse. Mm -hmm. Throughout scripture, whenever God talks to a prophet, he verbally talks to a prophet, or he has a vision, it's usually specified of what's here. To me, it almost sounds like mm -hmm. he's being moved by the Spirit on what to say, and then of course, he goes on to say that God told Joshua to say this. Yeah. Um, but it, it doesn't, typically throughout scripture, it, it notes that God spoke to this person, or they had a vision, the prophet had a vision. We don't see that here in this, in, in this instance. Yeah. It's, I think what's going on here. And I think that's a good point, that the, the text doesn't explicitly tell us how the Lord is guiding Joshua in some of these instances, like when Joshua lays this curse down. Uh, and I think part of what's going on is that the, the text is inviting us to the same decision that Israel has had to make. Right? Because Moses has died... And now Joshua has been put in Moses' place, and Israel is left with this choice. Are you going to follow the Lord by following his servant Joshua, or are you going to reject him by rejecting his servant Joshua? Um, and so we as the readers, we're not given all of these details that we're used to having as readers of the Bible. Um, so that... As we're reading through, it's like we're having to make the same decision that Israel's making. We should be able to look at Joshua and at what he's doing and what's happening and understand, oh, the Lord is behind all of this. Right? Like, the, the Lord, you know, we're not told explicitly in this instance that it's the Lord doing this, but it has to be the Lord. Yeah, whether it, we're talking um, the, the Spirit's upon him or that the Lord has told him this in some other context. But we understand that it comes from the Lord. Well, you know Joshua, that Joshua took every detail God told him and lived it out to yes. 100%. Yes, like carried it out to a T. He, he did 99% of what God told him to do. He makes one mistake and he vanished. Yes. Here's Joshua that, that, that follows everything God says yes. to the T. And, and, and so when you see that, but it doesn't specify, and, and assumptions sometimes can get you in trouble. Mm -hmm. But you've got to believe that the Holy Spirit yeah, the Lord is behind Joshua in some way. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I think that's, that is a good thing to mention, that, the, uh, that Joshua has been observing everything to a T. Because, again, one of the themes of this book is, all right, what's it look like if Israel could follow everything to a T? How long can Israel sustain perfection, as it were? And we find out immediately in the very next verse, not long. <laughs> but the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. So something's revealed to us that we previously did not know, right? The way it's described in chapter 6, Israel looked as if it was faithful 
in carrying out the ban on Jericho. And again, as far as Israel knew, Israel was faithful in carrying out the ban. It's only this one man, Achan, who smuggles out some of the Cherem. Nobody else knows about it. And we just learn about it for the first time here in chapter 7, verse 1. And because Achan takes from the Cherem, the Lord's anger burns against Israel. This is one of only three times in the entire book of Joshua that we see the word anger. Now, you look back, think back over our Law of Moses study. How many times did we see the anger of the Lord burn against Israel back then? I mean, you couldn't sling a dead cat without hitting a passage where the, Lord, the Lord's anger burned at Israel. Yeah, we see this, this phrase, or this word in particular, anger. You see it ten times in Exodus? You see it 15 times in Numbers? You see it 13 times in Deuteronomy? You only see it three times in the entire book of Joshua. You see it here. We're going to see it at the very end of this chapter to kind of close everything up. So after the problem of sin has been dealt with in verse 26 of this chapter, then the Lord turned from his burning anger. All right, so... Uh, there has been repentance made, things have been made right, so the, anger's, er, the Lord's anger stops burning. The only other time we see it is towards the end of the book, in chapter 23, verse 16, and this is as a warning against transgression. In other words, if you transgress the covenant, the Lord's anger will burn against you. It's a warning that's given to Israel. This is the only time in the entire book that we see the Lord's anger burn against Israel. Uh, we should store that away, by the way, because there are going to be other things that happen in this book that will strike us as if, like, it would, our, our gut reaction would be, oh, of course the Lord's going to be angry with Israel. I'm thinking it's specifically of what happens with, uh, with the Gibeonites. Uh, there will be occasions where we, our gut reaction would be to say, oh, Israel's done wrong course God's going to get mad at them. We don't see God get mad at them. It's only here. But we need to see the consequence of what happens when the Lord's anger burns against Israel only once and only on account of one guy. Um, remember what Joshua has said about the Hiram. That the uh, the taking from the harem will make Israel harem. Again, this is something that Israel has been warned about. Uh, we're pretty much at the end of our time here. So I think the last thing that we'll do is have just a brief look at the law. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 17. So this is one of the punishments for idolatry. Right, if you hear that people in your cities have gone out to worship other gods, then basically that whole city comes under the bank. What we read in chapter 13, verse 17, none of the devoted things shall stick to your hand that the Lord may turn away from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy and have compassion on you and multiply you as he swore to your fathers if you obey the voice of the Lord your God keeping all his commandments that I'm commanding you today and doing what is right in the sight of the Lord your God all right so Israel's had this already and they've been warned if you take any of the devoted stuff the anger of the Lord is going to burn against you and now we have a situation where that's happening so We'll see what happens on account of that next week as we consider the story of AI. Uh, I tell you what, we'll learn, we'll leave this to next week as well. We always pronounce it AI because that's just kind of the best we can do with a name like that in English. 
It actually sounds a lot funnier in Hebrew. So we'll do that next week as well. Thank you so much for your kind attention and your questions and comments this morning.